Achtung, Achtung, it's James Holland here on We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Um, it's holiday season, so we're sort of away at the moment, but this is a recording of an interview I did with Stan Perry uh, earlier in June, up at his home in Lincolnshire, talking about his time with the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry in World War II. And can you, I mean, were the feelings of apprehension, excitement as you're, you're finally crossing? Because you must be thinking, right, this is it. Um, I, I was either rather arrogant, perhaps, perhaps a bit laid back, but it was all part of a scene, and right. um, I, by then, although I was still a fairly junior subaltern, um, I'd been through, uh, the trials of older life. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I was, what, 20 years old. Um, I, I, for example, one of my sergeants had got the local um, pub owner's daughter into trouble. <laughs> and he thought I was going to sort out his problems with his wife. <laughs> and uh, this girl in trouble and uh, I was 19 years old and he was 45 or something oh my and, goodness. Um, and one grew up very very quickly yeah. as a, uh, a junior officer but then I, I caught up with uh, SRY on uh, presumably near Tilly pardon? B presumably near Tilly uh, yes, uh, fell in it. Uh, well, um, I, I'd rather think at the bottom of uh, 103. Oh, Saint Pierre. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, round about there. Um, uh, names, village, um, the sequence of um, places escapes me. I, right. Um, the geriatric memory can't recall. I, I read. Um, Stanley Christophers and then I read Stuart Hills and uh, I read uh, Padre Skinner's yes. uh, notes. Um, but what was it like arriving? Because you're arriving in the in the thick of it. They've just come I, up against the um, Panzer haven't they? And yes, they were a bit wary. Um, but were you welcomed in? I mean, was it? Was yes, I, I. I. That was the great thing about my first experience of SRY. John Samkin. Samkin. Uh, I think it was John Samkin who greeted me. Was it? He was A Squadron. I think was he acting adjutant, or possibly couldn't have been second in command because that was. He was. Been. He was. He was deputy commander. He was. He was a troop commander in A Squadron. Then Keith Douglas got killed. So yeah. He was then deputy commander of A Squadron. Then Mike Laycock got killed. killed. So Stanley then and took Stanley over. And Stanley then took over. And then Semkin took over at A Squadron. Mm. Well, Laycock was um, colonel. So he was still alive when you but got there? He was still alive when I got there, but I didn't really meet him. Mm. And I'm fairly sure it's John Semkin who welcomed me. Very possibly. And uh, took me to see Peter Tulleri. Yes who was uh, squadron commander of C Squadron. Yep. And I was posted to C Squadron. Right. And I was given number four troop, troop <laughs> as being the new boy. Yeah. Um, my... Uh, I mean, it must be quite daunting, isn't my it? My radio, radio code sign was dog. <laughs> <laughs> Rather as amusing. Um, but was it quite daunting taking over a troop, you know, coming in? Yeah, um... That was the first thing one had to do, was to get some um, confidence and uh, relationship with the, with, 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 with the crew. Mm. Um, well, the crew and, and all the crews in your a, troops. A, 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 well, eventually, the, the whole troop eventually, yeah. but uh, in particular, of course, the, your the tank. tank crew. Two of them were ex-Nottinghamshire miners or... If they hadn't been miners, they'd been in the... 
And had, had the person you replaced been wounded? Um, I never knew who I replaced, to well, be honest. Yeah. But um, certainly they'd lost him one way or another, whether he'd been wounded or killed. I, yeah. I, I'm, I am not certain. But um, the, they spoke, uh, they used to chat together. Well, the miners. Um, and they used back slang. Have you ever come across that? No. Well, it, it's uh, it's a way of speaking. Ude uye okte ak Do you talk back slang? And they take the uh, consonant from the front of a word yeah. and put it in the back and add A. God, so, do becomes Ude. Right. If you follow me. Yeah. Orkte. Yeah. Akbe. Angsle. <laughs> like and this was a sort of... Um, and um, they used to chat in that. Uh, and I did a little... I I'm, I was fairly good at languages. I I spoke fairly fluent French, and yeah. um, ultimately I learnt some German, and um, then uh, later in life I learnt Danish, and wow. um, uh, very fluent. In, I'm still fluent in Danish, um, but I sort of got, got, got on, did you? I got to know from somewhere, I don't know how I picked it up, but I, I got to know what it was all about. Right. And I learned. <laughs> and uh, this was in the first couple of days in the, in the tank, and uh, they were chatting away. Um, I'm probably talking about that young bloody idiot they'd just taken on as a... <laughs> New commander, and uh, I spoke to them in backslang, <laughs> and they were absolutely aghast. And, um, but that was the beginning of a very close relationship. Yeah, and uh, that that was quite fun. What were the two miners called? What were the names of the two miners? I I really um uh, Bob and Charles, but I can't. Bob and Charles. I, I, I've. I was saying to somebody, yes, I was talking to Don Young, the um, regimental uh, welfare officer, the night before last, and I said to him, I, I feel very ashamed that I do not remember the surnames of any of my... Um, well, you remember their Christian names, that's the main I remember the Christian names. I think my gunner was called... Bob Barrett or Barnett, but I, I it just totally escapes me. Um, uh, but but by speaking passing at them, you kind of disarmed them a bit, I, I would imagine. Well, yes, it did. It, it, uh, I, th I think they were a bit worried about what they, be, <laughs> whether they'd been. Uh, uh, <laughs> critical of me and yeah. that I'd understood what they were saying <laughs> but uh, we never let on if they were and um, it, but it it began a um, it began an understanding and um, right. and a relationship which um, when one's sleeping in a hung up sheet on the side of the tank and probably virtually under the same blanket, um, it becomes difficult to be distant. <laughs> yes, no, sure. Um, I mean, can you remember going into action for the first time? Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember my first action, and I think it must have been Hill 103 mm -hmm. after we'd captured it. Yeah. And I was directed to... Um, take the troop and station hull down on the top of a hill and, and I uh, on, on in retrospect I think it must have been 103 um, because it had a 
quite a, a, a distant view. Yeah, it sort of slowly rolls down, doesn't it, down towards the yes, Sewell Valley. That's right. And there's a there's a track that runs across the top of it. Yeah. With, with a sort of trees and a and a, a mound. That's I, right. I you were able to get hull down. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I was sitting there, hull down. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but um, I was protecting somebody, <laughs> right. and we were being shelled pretty heavily. Um, both some um, artillery and mortar. I was sitting on the top of the bank, and um, look, I was there for hours. I think I was there for about ten hours. Well, so, in that position, that hold down position. Yes, just to hold the position, but. Um, I was scanning, obviously, with binoculars and uh, looking over the country, and I saw this church steeple, and there were some rather suspicious-like movements going on halfway up the steeple and flashing. And, as I say, we were being shelled <coughs> Uh, I wasn't being shelled uh, uh, over my head, yeah. but, um, being f f quite heavily shelled and um, quite targeted. And I came to the conclusion that this was a, being spotted a by the gunner um, observer. Yeah. And uh, so I did a troop shoot on the um, on the church steeple. I never know what village it was, but um, it, it certainly stopped the um, stopped the artillery uh, really? bombardment quite a bit. Now, that was my first. And that was the end of the spire, presumably. That was the end. Yeah, of the Yeah, that was the end. I'm, and I, I'm quite sure he was an artillery observer, mm. and. Uh, so uh, perhaps that solved my conscience a bit <laughs> about <laughs> destruction of a church steeple. And, uh, and can you remember the headquarters being hit in Saint Pierre and Lacot being killed? I, I remember, yes, um, I was a bit distant from it. I, we weren't anywhere near headquarters then. Uh, one of the problems of being um, in Independent Armoured Brigade, you're attached to different battalions. You were you? detached, uh, even detached as uh, 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 a, a troop or two. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, mm. and you were. Uh, I'm in contact with squadron headquarters, but um, some. Presumably, five, sometimes you'd spend days not seeing them. At five all. or ten miles away from. Yeah. Um, the squadron headquarters, so. But do you think do you think you sort of slotted into into frontline life reasonably well? Um, yeah, I. Um, I mean, were, were you good under fire? I mean, because because you don't even know how you're going to respond until you're. In no, that I, you? it did never worried me over much. Um, mm. I was in a, a number of battles, and um, I lost one tank that brewed up. Through my carelessness, I um, showed me bum to the uh, um, an, an, an anti-tank gun, actually. But I I was considered a bit of a weirdo by um, <laughs> some parts of the regiment because um, I had a rule that as soon as the troop moved off. Some time after that, I would call halt and um, dismount, and I expected my tank crew and my troop tanks to immediately bail out, no matter where they were, what was the ground was like. Was that just a training exercise? It was. It was what I thought was some. Um, uh, a life-saving exercise that if we were hit and brewed up, we had a bar in Sherman's, particularly in the petrol Sherman's, uh, you've got 20 or 30 seconds 
to get the hell out of it uh, or get burned. Yep. And um, I thought it was important that we had routines and um, so really, really well drilled quick reactions. Yep. You, you didn't mess about, bail out meant get the hell out. Right. And um, in in the tank we had a routine where I went first because I was bunging up the hole, of course, mm -hmm. and the gunner put his shoulders under my bum and Shut gave you. me a shove and the wireless shot came across and got his shoulders under the gunner and gave him a shove and the gunner reached down and caught the wireless ops um, hands and gave him a pull out so we went out in a quick stream right. um, bloody dangerous to break your leg off yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, better that than burnt. better than getting burned. Um, I mean, what did he make of the show? Um, it uh, was a bit thin-skinned. It was um, very vulnerable to being hit in the back end and brewing up. Yeah. Um, but um, we used to drape spare track sections over the front of the um, mm. armour, yep. which gave us a bit more protection. Yep. And uh, we used to stow all our gear on the back. And I mean, it was very reliable, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that was the great thing about it. It was some. Um, I know, the, the gun, the, the 75 wasn't bad. It was quick, wasn't it? Quick firing. Uh, and quick firing. The, um, Had the stabilising gyro on it as and, well. And the point five machine guns were very effective. Right. Um, they were not... And there's um, that switch, which I haven't appreciated, was a switch for the commander. So you've got the gunner. You've got the gunner co controlling the turret, but, but the commander's got a little switch that he can override. Yes. The, the I mean, no other tank had that, I don't think. No. No, it didn't. And um, Personally, I never used it because my gunner was very, um, very competent. Right. And uh, I used to swear at me. What's the bloody range, then? <laughs> you know, I'd give him an order. Um, turret Travis right, right on and then forget to say 280 yards or whatever <laughs> it was and Gunner would say what's the bloody range then? That's so funny. Um, so he didn't <laughs> didn't hang back but he, he was very good. He's also a good cook. Um, yes, do you really did live in each other's pockets didn't you? we did yes and uh, even our rations um we lived on the um seven day ration which theoretically was um one day for seven men or seven days for one man right. <laughs> and uh, it had uh, tinned um pork and vegetables and tinned meat and vegetables. Mm. I had 50 cigarettes in it. Did you smoke then? Uh, I did then. Um, I don't know why I started smoking, but probably because Everyone else was. sitting up on top of a hill doing nothing yeah. for 10 hours, one got through a lot of cigarettes. And what about tea? Tea, uh, my... My wireless hawk was um, was a, a clever little guy. He sort of um, he got a primer stove, right? Which he'd welded up uh, uh, an attachment on it, right? And uh, he made himself a um, lidded jug, metal jug, right? And. Uh, he reckoned to be able to brew on the move 
<laughs> through this little primer stove That's thing, brilliant. the Dixie and the. Yeah. Um, so what uh, was your wife? So Bob was the. Uh, was we drank the a lot of tea. Good, but Bob was the gunner. The gunner's name was Bob. Yes. And and the one I thought it was that Charles. He was Ron. He was Ron. Yeah. So Charles, Charles was the driver. Charles was the Charles was the lap gunner. And I cannot, uh, the driver changed quite frequently. Okay. Um, the, the rest of the crew I had for quite a little while, but there used to be quite frequent changes depending on the disposition of um, skills. So you might lose. And so where was Ron from? Was he a Nottinghamshire boy? Um, I think it was Ron and Ron and Bob who were uh, uh, Nottinghamshire. Right. Uh, and I, uh, the other one lived somewhere over in the towards the northwest. Okay, so it was Ron and Bob who were the were the. Pardon? The, there was Ron and Bob who spoke in slang, was it? Yes. Right. 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 Yes. And. Um, they, and how did you find when you were an actor? I mean, how did you find cooperating with the infantry? Were there, were there problems, or was it was it because um, was one of the issues was communication, wasn't it? I had a lot of difficulty with infantry. Um, infantry commanders who wanted to go their way rather than mine. Because you're both going to be coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Yeah, right? that's right, uh, but. Um, I got my orders from my squadron commander where I was going to go. Right, and you have to do it. Uh, and uh, I couldn't so be... So Peter Solari was your squadron commander? Squad uh, he was first, and then he got wounded. That's right. And um, Jack Holman was... Oh, yes. Jack Holman was my squadron commander for most of the time. And what was he like? Then he was laconic. Dashing. Fun? He was always rather dashing. Very laconic. Yeah. Um, Oh yes, he loved a bit of flamboyancy. I remember when it was raining, when he um, was driving in his tank and he put an umbrella up. <laughs> <laughs> Had an umbrella over his head. But he was not... Um, he was not awfully good at communication. Right. Um, one of the big problems of being a troop commander was that there was an enormous shortage of maps. Right. You know, you didn't have a map. Right. And you'd be told to go here or there and... <laughs> um, you know, they were not even placed names right. quite often. And um, uh, Jack had maps and one could take a little sketch. Yeah, it's not quite the same, is it? But it was a rough sketch and... Yeah. You weren't all of a sudden you put in all the salient points, you know, because you um, we we held what was called an O group. I don't know yeah. if you've come across that, yeah. probably. And, um, so that'd be squadron coming together. You all the officers have a chat. Oh, that's it. Yes, the squadron commander would get the two officers together and um, give them a briefing. Um, but um, I recall he would say things like, um, you're going uphill, uh, two and a half miles, get to the top of the hill. Uh, what do I do when I get there? I'll tell you that when you get there. It would be Jack's sort of approach. <laughs> so you were uh, sometimes working a bit in the dark. Um, but you asked me about infantry. Um, some were very, very good. In particular, I'd call in the second part of my um, time with the regiment, um, the Rifle Brigade were giving me cover on one action. Right. And they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And they're platoon commander was in touch all the time 
what did I want and what did he want and um, we worked together um, and I've got a picture in there in uh, what's that book called the photographs the road to Berlin road to Berlin uh, there's a picture of my troop in there oh really and it's Hilarious. covered well, with lowland that. scots <laughs> um, it was obviously posed yeah. It was two or three days before I got wounded the second time and um, it was obviously posed because there was a bloke sitting on my 75 right. uh, barrel right. and uh, the gunner would have <laughs> gunner would have had his ears off if uh, it hadn't been a posed thing. He wouldn't allow anybody to ride on his, on his barrels because he spent a right. lot of time... Uh, Calibrating his gun, and uh, but did did you have a sort of a, a daily routine, or was it was it just whatever came your way? Oh yes, so it was day to day. Virtually, sometimes two or three days in a run. Hmm. Um, what time would you be up in the morning? Dawn. So you'd form up into a leaguer the night before. I mean, it'd be three o'clock in the morning, perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes you're in a leaguer, sometimes you'd be on your own, sometimes be two troops together. And presumably before you can have, I mean... You could have a squadron leaguer. And when, when you're stood down the evening before, is it someone, one person's job to get the food and the other people to do the maintenance? Or, or, or um, at, in my troop we had, um, my gunner was a good cook. He had a party piece, which was, uh, he had a canvas bag and he used to fill it with some um, ship's biscuits right. and he used to put it in between the um, track uh, roller right. and run the tank backwards and forwards. And crushed it all up. And crushed it all up. And then he would mix it with some... Um, tinned um, pork and vegetables or meat and vegetables yeah. and make what he called chapatis <laughs> which he used to fry up over the, uh, over, the over the primus and so he used to cook for us but yes there was an uh, absolute routine um, on arriving back or wherever you're going to rest for darkness or overnight because quite often we'd be out at three or four o'clock in the morning yep. and not be back in the rest until ten o'clock in the evening. But you've got to look after your tank haven't you? Yeah uh, but um, there was an absolute routine when you landed was um, the driver uh, and the lap gunner the co-driver would uh, fuel up yep. and uh, quite often that would be jerry cans and uh, sometimes even have to form a little chain yeah, yeah. so um, we all had to muck in then a gunner um, and uh, wireless op it, uh, this was my routine mm -hmm. gunner and wireless op um, would uh, replace some um, armament yep. and check everything inside the turret was um, yep. was properly housed so that it didn't roll about and mm -hmm. and they'd get rid of um, shell cases yep. and that sort of thing and then uh, we would cook if we were able uh, a, a, a bit of a late night meal mm -hmm. and then uh, most of the time uh, certainly in Normandy not uh, later on in Holland and Germany but in Normandy um, we just uh, hooked a sheet up on the um, side of the tank and made a little uh, sort of bivouac little bivouac and yeah and you just lie down on the ground then sleep down there. 
Well, we're just going to take a break now, but do join us again to hear more from Stan Perry. So what did you do, put out your kind of sort of all skin mat? And no I was, bag? um, I was a bit flash. I had a, um, <laughs> I had a sleeping bag. <laughs> And would you sleep fully clothed, or what? You... Yes, um, you. I quite often completely fully clothed, full battle dress. Right. Um, used to wear a tank jacket quite often, so. Um, tank you, jacket. Yeah, you'd take that off. Uh, that was just a, a jacket over your yeah. over your battle dress. Um, but, but you had, I mean, do you have those sort of battle dress suits, didn't you, as tank men, or did you have traditional battle dress? Um, I had, uh, battle dress and trousers. Yeah. What did uh, you think of those? By surge. The way? Um, warm and comfortable. Yeah, um, they're pretty good. Saved my life with the, uh, um, when I was wounded the second time, because um, I'd met my wife and married. And she'd given me for my twenty-first birthday a um, leather wallet with two photographs in, and I'd put them in the breast pocket of my battle dress. And when I got hit by the mortar bomb, um, and later on the surgeon said he'd taken a piece of shrapnel off the wall of my heart. Uh, which had obviously pierced this um, leather wallet. Still got it. Oh, it's, amazing. Um, still got the holes in it. That's extraordinary. Um, and um, he said that if it hadn't been uh, decelerated going through something stronger, yeah, it would alone. almost certainly have penetrated my heart. and. I would have been a goner, so I always thought my wife saved my life, you know. <laughs> and being in my battleless breast pocket. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I didn't dislike the battle. It was a bit rough. Um, um, having been a parachutist, uh, I was a bit fancy. You know, that, um, Had the Denison. Having... Uh, managed to uh, purloin a parachute canopy yeah. which was made of silk I'd had it run up into some underwear <laughs> so, oh really? Um, Very we fancy. had a theory that uh, if you wore silk underwear you couldn't get fleas <laughs> was it true? I, well I didn't get fleas so I <laughs> <laughs> um, so I assume yes, uh, because we didn't wash very often, yeah. not thoroughly. So no. what was the tanker's jacket you had then? Was it an American one? Um, yeah, it was just a canvas um, canvas jacket with a bit of camouflage on it. It was just a camouflage jacket. Right, uh, right, right. right. Um, it was handy because it had more pockets. So it wasn't the Denison smock that they gave to the paratroopers? Um, I did have uh, one that uh, had a strap which yes, right, yeah. came up under the groin. That's it. Yes, so that's I, 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 I did have one of those until um, until the first time I was wounded, and uh, they sent all my gear back, but my jacket never appeared with it. So that was. That. <laughs> that was rather funny. I um, when I was shot the first time. Um, I, I, I always carried a forty-five automatic on my belt, and I always had a couple of Mills grenades tucked into a pouch on my yeah. belt. Um, old time training, I suppose. Um, but uh, when I uh, when I was wounded the first time, that was in Normandy. In Normandy, my gear was sent back to Liverpool, and then shipped down to my father at my home. <laughs> and uh, when I got repatriated and 
was talking to Dad. He said, what am I going to do with this? I said, well, I'll just sit on it until I come home again. And he said, yeah, but what am I going to do with this bloody gun? They'd said about the Colt I'd got a pistol in there. Um, that so was what was the circumstances in which you got... I mean, do you, do you remember any of the individual battles? Or are they all yes, I, I, the one was, that's very clearest in my mind is the one where I got shot, uh, the, the crossing of the Noiro. Right. So uh, where, where um, was that? That was after Onderfontaine, was it? Yes. Um, it, I was the first tank out of Normandy. Ah. And um, I, you got it written down, actually. <laughs> Lieutenant Stanley Perry was the first tank to cross the Noiro. <laughs> I'd forgotten. Um, actually, um, Stanley had got it slightly wrong in his um, diaries, I think. Right. Because it says that I crossed on the hastily reconstructed bridge. Right. Which would have been in Condé. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, I had to wade. Right. Um, uh, there's a long story to this. Oh, well, do uh, tell. Uh, we'd been fighting. We'd had a couple of days quite rough um, battling down towards the Noiro from Hotto, I think. That would have been. Yep. Would have been Jouk. Jerk was, uh, was before Onderfontein. Jerk and Veer. Yeah, Veer is after, is after that. They're it? both very much in my mind. It's all part of Blue Coat, Operation and Blue Cahania. Coat. And Cahania. Yeah. Cahania. And Comont. Comont. Yes, yeah, so you started, Co you moved to Comont. You were moved from, you took over from the Americans. That's right. And I nearly got myself over. killed there. Oh, why? I was, um... Taking my troop through the through Comor and shutters open and head up, and suddenly got a wire across my throat. There was a a, a a radio or power wire or something strung across the street. Oh goodness! Just the right hit to catch my throat. Luckily. I had a very good driver. I bellowed halt. <laughs> and snatched away. And I was just able to get it off and over. But it was it was a bit close, close run. Yeah. But we'd been we'd been in that area somewhere with a, a fair bit of fighting, mostly with um, German infantry and um, was this after you got to Comor? Pardon? Before. This is before or after Comor? Uh, I think this was after Comor. Yeah, because then it was Operation Blue Coat, and you were advancing south with 30 Corps. That's right. You had 8 and, Corps on your right. And we had... Um, and that's when you went to Kahanye in Was that the Adolf Hitler? Well, the, the Adolf Hitler, the, the Hitler Jugend guys, the, the 12th SS, were at, you would have come across them at Rore and La Fontaine. Yeah. And that, that had been a bit rough. So that was sort of end of June, beginning of July, that kind of time. August 15th. August 15th. Yes, because Blue Coat was launched on, I think, the 30th of yes. July. Um, and, and you were in Onderfontaine about. 4th of August, something like that, 5th, off the top of my head? Yes, um, I, I have grave difficulty in remembering. No, that's all right. Um, one of the things I said, uh, Jackie Holman was not over-communicative. Um, lots of the um, attacks and battles had code names. Yes. Uh, but he never used them. <laughs> and we never ever got to know what they what were. code now. Right, but you remember the name of the villages you passed through, some of them. Uh, some, um, I, I remember particularly um, Tilly, of course, yes. Tilly Bacage, and Orne sur Odon. Yes. 
Yes. Which Born appalled it. me. It had been... It was um, absolutely pulverised, wasn't it? Fun. It was absolutely flattened. It was absolutely flattened. I was driving my tanks. There were no sign of roads. No. Driving my tanks over rubble. Yeah. Uh, the church was still standing. It, and it, yeah, and it's, it's funny because you can match up. There's a very famous photo of going into um, into Orne, and you can see the church and the and the town hall, the the, the mairie. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, but and every, either side of it is just. Yeah, it was. It was just rubble. It's completely rebuilt. Um, it's um, nice now. I, um, the Americans were lovely chaps. So you met, in, you bumped into them in COVID. Individually, particularly lovely chaps. Collectively, uh, the one or two questions. Um, we believed that if an American observer saw a man and a dog moving in a village, they would call up an artillery bombardment <laughs> and flatten the village yeah. before they went to have a look. And we believed that the British approach would be to go and have a look, and if it was occupied, then perhaps yeah. call out. Uh, well, certainly British artillery responsible for the flattening of Orne, that's for sure. Fun? It was certainly British artillery that flattened, flattened Orne. Flattened Orne, yes. But but we, we were very suspicious of that. I, I remember taking over from a, an American troop in an orchard. And, um, this is in Normandy, was it? In Normandy. Yes, yeah, so that would have been when you were moving up to Comorn, I would have thought. Yes. Because it was the well, 1st Infantry Division were moving, moving out to do Operation oh, Comorn. Yes, uh, that, would have, that sounds about right. Um, but I, I know I moved into this orchard to, to league her up mm. and um, I got to chat um, first off it made me rather slightly irritable that um, it was an American captain who was a troop commander and I was, I was only a subaltern <laughs> and his pay rate was probably yeah. three times mine <laughs> um, and then I, I said to him Oh, what's it like in the orchard here? Oh, absolute bloody hell. And I said, oh, 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 how's that? He said, we've been shelled to hell. Well, the first shell hole I could see was 40 or 50 yards away in an open field. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we're a little bit wary, but um, we, we made good friends. Um, but I was saying, um, the battle I remember best uh, was the crossing of the Noiro, and I remember that in... But that's right at the end of the Normandy some, campaign. Some detail. Right. I, um, uh, we'd been fighting for a couple of days, and it had been a bit rough, and I'd leaguered up at about 10 o'clock at night. It was just coming dusk and um, gone through all the routines and Stanley sent for me and said um, I w want you to do a little job for me um, can't get the recce troop down there but uh, I'd like to have a look at that river and see whether it's crossable because we think the bridge has been blown uh, and this was just would have been to the east, I think, of Condé, mm. Condé Saint Noir, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he said you were in the SAS, so you're used to doing a little night job. Um, will you go and have a look and tell me whether it's crossable? So Did you I, mind? Fun? Did you mind? Were you, were you worried about that? No, it was just another job, and right. and uh, I I suppose I was rather rather proud that the colonel had thought of me. Right, and um, <coughs> I, I, that was the one thing about Stanley Christopherson. I think every single member of the regiment that I ever met would have done anything for him. <laughs> Stanley was very upper class. But he um, 
had a facility for knowing people and befriending people, whatever their rank, whatever their style, mm. whatever they were. He, he was a, a, a wonder regimental commander, he really was. Mm. And um, so we, if Stanley said, Go and look at the river. Jump up in the air three times, you jumped up in the air three times. Um, he, we had that regard for him as our commander. Anyway, I had to crawl through some of this bacage and um, luckily fairly dense foliage because the bloody ground was still occupied by um, German machine guns. Oh um, and I, I had an infantryman with me who was supposed to be my guard and I had a, um, a, 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 a sapper who had a mine detector right. and so we we were sort of more or less crawling about in the dark and suddenly saw these cigarette lights <laughs> um, with a bit of careful listening and it was a German machine gun post stuck in and uh, the, the instrument was very keen on them having a go at it, and I said, not bloody likely. That'll tell everybody we're here, and um, we want to get down and have a look at this river. So you so, skirted past them? Fun? So you skirted past them? We, we skirted around them and uh, went down to the river, and uh, I thought it was perfectly passable. Um, one particular place what, where... for tanks? For tanks. Uh, it was a bit sandy at the bottom, and uh, but it was pretty shallow. But there was it was only three or four feet deep. It was uh, there wasn't a lot of water, um, but the the sandy bottom was maybe a bit of a worry. Um, but it looked there was one place where it looked as if cattle had been uh, watering. Right, so it sort of trampled it down. So the bank was trampled down right. and. Uh, and you could tell that, that in the in the moonlight, could you? Fun. You could tell that in the in the night light. It was a bit of a yes. Moon, you could it? see it was. Um, uh, well, it didn't get. It got dark, but not very dark. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we were in August and yep. not quite dog days, but um, yep. uh, yes, it was. Uh, I mean, going down to the river was easy enough to have a look and see and um, we came back and uh, the infantryman and I uh, decided to have our fun with the um, machine gun post so I uh, gave them a few mills grenades to share <laughs> Really? and uh, so we, we put that out of action because we were on the way home and I didn't mind people knowing that we'd been, um, went and reported to Stanley that... So how far back was Stanley from the river at this point? I mean, how far back was the regiment? Half a mile. Okay, so it's few, down a lane through a few fields, that kind Something of thing. like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe a bit more. Okay. But, um, I mean, he, he was in, obviously... Well, what uh, were you armed with, just your Colt 45? Reasonably safe Liga. Yeah. Fun. And you were just armed with your 45 and your Mills bombs? Yes. Uh, and... You um, have a Sten or a Thompson? And the or... infantryman had... Uh, I think he had a Sten. Didn't like a Sten. Really? If you dropped it, it went off. Yeah, well, it didn't <laughs> have that tension. <laughs> you blew, blew your leg off if you weren't careful. Um, so I, I never had a Sten, I, I managed to acquire a Tommy gun. When did you? The, the difficulty of sidearms for a, a, a tank troop commander was um, actually getting supplies of ammunition mm. because obviously Quartermaster didn't stock no. necessarily the right uh, things. I had, a, um, I had a little Mauser that I'd... Uh, relieved a German of, which uh, he had no further use for. And well, I, where did you get that one? A knocked out tank? 
fun. On a, on a German on a tank or just... No, a... it was German infantryman that I shot. Oh. <laughs> um, when did you do that then? Was that, that earlier? That was a lot earlier. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd take these little miles off him and right. I'd got that tucked away. Right. <laughs> but finding, uh, finding ammunition for that was a bit tricky. Yeah. Well, it used the same as the Sten, didn't it, mate? Maybe not. <laughs> No, yeah. that was 9mm, wasn't it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. What was it about? 0.3? Mm, don't know. Anyway. S something like that. Yeah. At any rate, um, that, that was the difficulty with side arms. With, uh, <coughs> Getting out of um, I had one of these German um, uh, dismounted aircraft machine guns, which I liberated. <laughs> And uh, we we had a, a gun mounting on the turret of the Sherman, I remember, and uh, I put it up, but uh, after five minutes, uh, having fired it, I gave it away to an in passing instrument in a friend gun carrier, <laughs> because it brought down all the... All the muck you could think of from both sides. I walked in because it sounded like a German machine yeah. gun. Well, it was, um, God, what's it called? Was it MG17 or an MG34? Pardon? Was it an MG17 or an MG34 or... Had or a name. Those were the main light machine It was dis dismounted um, aircraft. Yeah, well, they could. They they had a sort of multi. Fired fourteen hundred rounds a minute. Or yeah, something. Oh, okay. It was an MG forty two then. Uh, it was your forty two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just unbelievably quick. It was. Uh, no, well, the big stack with that was, if you fired it, everybody thought you were a bloody German machine gun. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it was so recognisable yeah. for, um, that you got uh, shot at by everybody. Yeah. So I, I got rid of that pretty quickly. I didn't have a mounted, um, didn't have a mounted gun on the right. on the turret. Had the. Um, but you could have done if you wanted to. Was that I, a I, I could have done. Yeah. I had the point five Browning as a lap gun. Yeah. And the coaxial. Yeah. Point five Browning. Yeah. And uh, so ammunition was easy and. Yeah. Uh, one was happy with that. Um, uh, to say uh, tomorrow. Um, so you you got managed to get back. You knock out the German machine gun post. I knocked out a German machine gun post. Got back to uh, uh, Colonel and reported. Um, went back to my kip, which was then by about two o'clock in the morning or something. Yeah. At uh, three o'clock. Time to get up again. Got me shoulder shaken. Uh, runner from uh, Jack Holman. You know this river. You'll be lead troop. <laughs> <laughs> Point troop tomorrow. And I want you over the river by dawn. <laughs> Goodness. Um, so, uh, quick pack up being sworn out by Jack because we were too slow in getting off. <laughs> um, uh, set off, came to a wide field uh, full of uh, sappers who were mine clearing. I actually saw a dead blown up sapper on the way by which was rather off-putting. Um, Got to chat to the uh, officer in charge of the sappers, and he said, "Oh, you won't be able to get over here for another hour or two. We're still working." And uh, I'd got Jack on my back. <laughs> when are you going over the river? <laughs> so uh, after a little while, I said to the um, said to the troop, "Look, we'll have to risk it." Um, stay in my tracks and I'll lead. If I get blown up, <laughs> you'll know that uh, I've cleared the way for you. <laughs> but stay absolutely in my tracks. So we went over line ahead 
and we went down to the river line well, ahead. That must be a slightly nerve-wracking moment, isn't it? Fun. That's a bit nerve-wracking, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, better to face the chance of getting your front end blown off and getting a bollocking from Jack Holman. You <laughs> <laughs> probably chose the former. No, it, it's one of the things, I mean, it was... Um, it was obviously paramount in um, commanding circles that we crossed. Uh, we were aiming for Berjou, mm -hmm. and it was pretty critical to them that we got over. Anyway, it, um, got over the river, climbed up the bank, um, the, the hill, and I uh, had a big bang and a slithering noise across the top of my turret and a Panzerfaust uh, shell had carried away my radio aerial. Now I'd made a fundamental error, I think, because it was very, very dense bocage. Right. Um, Six, eight feet high. Yeah, hedgerows. No, um, no visions. And I deployed my troop in a staggered echelon because I thought we'd cover that. Oh, we were supposed to be clearing the, inf the hmm. German infantry machine gun posts and such. Were you going in on your own or did you have infantry with you? Uh, I was supposed to have, um, one of the Southern regiments. It, it, it was from the Wessex Division. Yeah. Um, I think it could have been the Wiltshires. Right. Uh, I was supposed to have a platoon of them, but I I was stopped. Um, I crossed the river, and I was stopped by a senior officer. I think he was the Lieutenant Colonel, probably commanding officer of. Uh, this Wiltshire unit, and he said, Germans are digging in down here and to the right. Uh, come with me and support my uh, troops and we can winkle them out. Um, well, my directions were to go up the hill. So I, I called Jack and um, Although the, this chap threatened to put me under open arrest for not obeying his, his orders. Really? And uh, he was a bit arrogant. Um, I said, well, I, I, I called Jack and he said, do as you're told. You're heading for the top of the hill, you're covering the Bairdew Road. Don't go swanning off anywhere else. So this infantryman was really very uh, aggressive so I said hey look you better talk to my uh, you better talk to my squadron commander so they spoke and then uh, the uh, infantryman turned his back in a half and said no uh, oh, that's it then and begged off and I never saw an infantry after that right um, so suddenly you're crashing the, the, the rise and, and you're on your own yeah, um, and going through the Bocage, there were lots of uh, pants of house about. They had little trucks, right. and they used to run through the... Uh, um, we, we, we caught one lot, but um, I did get hit by this pants of house, carried away my, the, my radio aerial, and my, my, my wild stopper said, I'm sorry, I've tried everything. But we've no connections. Right. I couldn't talk to my troop. Yeah. I couldn't talk to squadron commander. <coughs> I was completely out of touch. Yeah. So uh, I thought, well, best thing to do is um, go straight on and uphill. That um, I I was supposed to take the track. Right. But. 
um, I'm always a bit wary about tracks, <laughs> whether they're mined or not, course, when you're yeah. so close to the infantry. So I was laid off a bit from the track, um, but through the bacage, and the bacage was dotted with tall trees, mm. um, poplars, I think, probably, but they were dotted in between. So you were, you you couldn't take a straight line. You were right. having to dodge trees as well as get through all this sort of massive foliage and uh, shrubbery. Um, anyway, to, I, I thought best thing, keep heading up. The lads know where we're supposed to be going, so hopefully they'll follow. And it wasn't until much later I discovered that Brookie, Corporal Brooks, had, um, well, there were two stories about it. One said that he dismounted from his tank to do a foot recce, and I don't know why a desert uh, experienced Veteran. tank corporal yeah. would get out of his tank to go and do a foot recce. Yeah. Um, the other thing was, said that he'd been wounded and blown out of his tank, which seemed much more likely, been hit by a mortar bomb perhaps. And blown out of his tank uh, and I only discovered this later um, the sergeant had um, dismounted from his tank and gone across to try and help Brookie and he got mown down by machine guns so I'd lost Although I didn't know it, I'd lost both my corporal and my sergeant. Um, were they both killed? They were both killed. Uh, well, uh, Brookie, uh, I, I think he died on the spot, as far as I, yeah. uh, as far as I knew, because I got repatriated and lost touch, of course. Um, and anyway, I decided I'd push on and. Um, not knowing where the other two, but hoping that they were following. Um, and uh, there was another bang, and my lap gunner said, Christ, tore me trousers. And we'd been hit by a Panzer Faust on the, um, <coughs> on the front armor. Right. It had pierced the hole and the um, explosion that followed through was torn his trousers and scratched his legs. Wow. Uh, he'd been sitting with his feet apart. He's a bit uh, lucky. Uh, that, so that was a bit lucky. And then we came to a uh, on the top of the um, top of the Bearshu Lane it, it divided off at one point mm. and that's where you really avoid um, approach because that's where the 88 is likely to be right. parked yeah. hidden up on the division of the road so we, we went round that and kept off the road and um, came to a wayside calvary a wayside calvary yeah it was um, crucifix yeah and body of Christ. Yeah, I know the thing. Yeah, you know the thing. Um, and my lap gunner was a devout Catholic, mm. and pleaded with me that we dismount and uh, said our prayers. <laughs> <laughs> I drew the line at that, but we did stop and um, said a few prayers, or said a prayer. Yeah, um, that was as far as I would go went on a, a bit further and um, I it was getting pretty hairy um, I used to uh, I usually had my lids open yeah and I'd still got my lids open but there was a lot of flack from mortars right. and um, I heard um, 
before uh, I lost my radio, Bill Sleep had uh, been sniped. Right. And um, that made things a bit more uncomfortable. So I uh, thought, well, I'll shut, my, I'll shut my lids down a bit. Reached up, shutting the lids down, and my arm dropped down. <laughs> Said to me, oh, my intercom was still working, the, although the external, uh, the 19 set, of course, we had uh, A set, B set, and intercom. Um, said to my wireless up, crashed to me, stung by a bloody bee. And then I tried to lift my arm and I couldn't. You uh, sure? It was, it had broken the bone and I think the, the well, ulna was... Was it a single was, bullet? Pardon? Was it a bullet? It was a bullet. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it and we will find out what happens to Stan next time. <laughs>